Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I am very fortunate to be joined here with Jen Gardner. Many of you know her from TV, but she has a brand well beyond that. And um, welcome, Jen. Thank you. Hi, Ashley. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. We're going to have some fun over the next 30 minutes. Um, typically, we're all here live, but let me kind of reacquaint everybody with the women's and executives and healthcare and AdvaMed and how we can all be conveners of care in service of our patients. And I just wanted to start with just a huge thank you to all of you who, quite frankly, in the past 16 months have delivered unbelievably relentless focus on serving our patients, helping hospital systems triage both COVID cases and non-COVID cases, really globally connecting surgeons around the world to talk to each other, to help really develop the best armamentarium of care for COVID. You know, J&J, &J, we've been in, in med tech for over 100 years, and I couldn't be more proud of how collectively as an industry we've worked together to help do PPE, to help do ventilators, to get vaccines out there, out to the global public to really make sure that people are safe doing their jobs, both in the hospital and, and continuing to do cases, doing clinical trials. It's been a, an unbelievable year of resilience, agility, and smarts. So I'm gonna open with that. And on this, I'm gonna now turn it over to Jen. Um, so first question for you is, given your successful mm -hmm. act career, what motivated you to become an entrepreneur? Well, it's all kind of, uh, everything's kind of of a piece, you know, so the acting is something that really is so, um, it's so much fun selfishly. And it's like, I think it's the way people who play golf feel, who really love it. I've never played golf, but that feeling of I'll never be good at it. I'll never actually get there. But the pursuit of it is so um, just such a, it just feels like something you can grow at and keep working on for your whole life. And it, it still fascinates me. So that's something I'm so lucky that I ended up in this job that has been fun for me since I was a little kid on the stage in West Virginia, all the way until now. And it's, it's really, um, I, I'm never tempted to just ditch it and do something else wholeheartedly. But at the same time, what I love and is my absolute other passion is working for Save the Children. And as I've spent the last 13 years traveling the country, meeting moms and kids and babies and school teachers and superintendents and principals and seeing the difference that that early education can make in a child's life. So I started with that and then it turned to advocacy and I was advocating on the local state and federal level for money to go into, you know, early ed for money to go into rural America and into kids growing up in poverty. And that really um, fills up my heart. But what we've what I have learned in the process is that industry is so often holding up um, philanthropy, really, in our country, and industry is responsible for social change. And a great example of that is J and J. Um, you know, Peter Fazzolo is on the board of Save the Children with me. Um, we couldn't, we couldn't do what we do without Johnson and Johnson and companies like J and J really seeing the need and pouring your philanthrop philanthropic might behind. A, a little, you know, we're not little, we're second to UNICEF for kids around the world, but it just started to be like, well, I help other people sell things, but if I were part of a business from the beginning, then I could really put all of this energy into making sure that if the business worked, save the children would benefit. And so it's all kind of, it's all part of a, part of a grand plan, but then of course, finding the right business and committing to it and all of that, that's been a whole separate journey, but that was a big part of the impetus in the beginning. You really model that world of like the market basket of just being this professional expert, you know, as an actress, but also an entrepreneur. We heard all about the baby food and then and then just giving back to the world on, on Save the Children. So you really exemplify that market basket of life, Jen. Um, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges preventing some of the families from getting the care that they need? 
and how has kind of saved the children seeking to overcome some of these challenges? There are so many. It's so vast. It's kind of what we do in any country is so huge that it's hard to even explain because it's it's a really 360 view of what's needed. How can you treat a child for something if they're hungry? How can you, um, you know, but how can a child advance in life if they don't have books in their home? So you're really going back and how can, what do books matter if their mom isn't healthy enough to read to them? So it's, it's kind of, it's so vast. Um, but gosh, some of the biggest challenges are just, um, well, the opioid epidemic in rural America, it, or now it's so much beyond that. It's heroin, it's fentanyl, it's, uh, but it's just, it's just removing children from parents in these huge swaths. I visited a, um, a Save the Children school that happened to be in my home state of West Virginia. Wow. And I went into a little classroom and um, to 90% school had had child protective services at their home in the last year. Four children at the school were being adopted by school teachers right then. It, they were in the process of being adopted by school teachers. I visited a school in Tennessee where of the 20 kids in the first grade that Save the Children were part of the Save the Children program, two of them were living with one parent. The rest were had been farmed out to neighbors or friends or a teacher who just was taking kids in. And this is all driven by the opioid or the drug epidemic in, in the middle of the country. So, I mean, that's a good place to start. That's a pretty big challenge. Well, you have it from your local roots. You know, you, it's that notion of going home again and seeing what's going on in the community and how to kind of affect change and understand like some of that root cause very, very sobering, um, but, mm -hmm. but full of insight. So how about we go to maybe, you know, you're this businesswoman as well. Um, and we'll get to, you, you know, motherhood. We didn't get to talk about that yet. That's kind of fun too. Um, but what are some of the biggest challenges you faced as a business leader, you know, and how have you maybe used your personal experiences to help shape your approach to some of these challenges? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, the biggest challenge is I've never taken an economics class. I've never taken a business class. I um, I got a, a BFA when I went to college. Um, I was a chemistry major, and I switched early on t from, you know, getting a, a maybe a BS to a <laughs> Bachelor of Fine Arts. And um, it was heaven for me then because I just dove in. I read every play that was in print, I swear. Um, and I had the best, best time and danced and sang and, you know, just had a blast. But man, if I could go back and take one class where they taught you how to read a spreadsheet, where they taught you what a, a KPI is, where they taught just anything, I had no and still, I mean, there's not a meeting where, and I'm in them every day, where I'm not saying, you know, slacking someone on the side. What does this mean? What is that? Back me up. What is, you know, or just I take notes on everything and I circle what I don't know. So at the end of a Save the Children board meeting or at the end of Once Upon a Farm meeting, I mean, everything is circled and I just have to go back and learn it again and again and again until it starts to sink in and that's that's kind of something that I've embraced I've embraced being the you know the student I've embraced being the person who you know I'm going to raise my hand um in one way or another and that's um that's been something really joyful but um other than that gosh what are the challenges they are um the balance and making sure that you know things can can really focus on once upon a farm for a while with save the children being secondary when it, there's a movie the movie takes precedence over all of it but then just how does it all where just how does it all work i mean i feel like mo has worked with me for eight years we work side by side just trying to make everything fit into a day and i feel like the two of us work in a blender you know it's just like like i'll finish this and go straight to once upon a farm and get a kid COVID tested for school and you know the whole day just like all of us right we're all just kind of it's insane what we're all trying to do but it works but that that beautiful afghan of kind of life enrichment you know probably you know is your secret sauce and uh it's you know awesome to hear that you're willing to ask for help and be that consummate learner you know it's beautiful to hear that i remember early on in my career i didn't graduate with an mba i you know had undergrad 
And so I had to learn a PL, as you mentioned. And I would spend time with the CFO Friday morning. I would bring him, you know, some bagels and coffee and he'd do PL management 101. So um, you know, asking for help goes a long way. It does. And before we leave the topic, one thing that I think I really notice with kids is I don't know if it's just LA, but kids specialize so early in sports or in an interest or something that it's so kids are so young when they start to say, oh, I missed that. I can't play soccer because I all these kids have played since they were three, you know, and you just think, but you're six, you can, I promise, or you're 12. You haven't even gotten to the place where you would start to be good yet. Don't be scared. So I started um, uh, 10 years ago just okay, I'm just going to be a learner all the time. I'm always going to have something I'm really bad at that the kids see me learning from scratch. And I started with skiing because our family started skiing. I'd never skied before. And I'm learning, now I'm learning tennis and I can barely even, I just have no eye-hand coordination. I didn't grow up doing anything like that ever. But I like my kids showing up at the beginning or the end of a lesson and seeing me struggle, but trying really hard. I just think just for your own brain too. You just always need to be forcing something new down your own throat. <laughs> no, but it's beautiful that you're sharing that with your kids because it's hard to raise kids in today's environment. You know, there's a lot of pressure on them and a lot with social media and comparing them, you know, themselves and to your point on specialization. And I just think that that's beautiful that you can model being vulnerable, you know, and trying something we talk a lot about in the pandemic, I mean, in the med tech industry, you know, it's survival and resiliency. And a lot of it, you know, we have this whole basket of ideas. And the biggest thing is try something new for the first time. And, you know, you're vulnerable yes. and courageous and you try it and um, it gets your brain going again. It literally, you know, physically, there's a physical effect to that. So um, we'll spread that word. How about quarantining? Tell us your survival tips. Okay, 16 months into COVID, Life is starting to take some ebbs and flows, three steps forward, one step back. You're a mom, you're a professional, you run your business. How have you really built in recovery to kind of be at your best? Well, um, gosh, I haven't always been my best. Um, I think that's part of it is that we just, we can't all be our best all the time. Some days the kids have just managed for themselves, but gosh, my mom, um, made every meal and ran every carpool. And I don't know how she did it, but sometimes it was because she was ignoring two of us while she dealt with one of us. So I just have to believe that that kind of benign neglect um, is going to be ultimately a good thing. And it's going to teach my kids some life skills that they, they might not have had otherwise. Um, but one of the things that we've done <laughs> at my house is we have really gone hard at um, just creating fun where there wasn't any. So now we're kind of past this as the world is starting to be a little more open and kids are to school and they, they aren't just as locked down. But these crazy fake restaurants where there was a theme and I would dress up as a crazy waiter. And sometimes I was changing clothes between being the waiter and the maitre d. And we would set a table somewhere different and give them a menu. And it was a lot of work, but it just became like, our fun thing to surprise and to change it up. And the other thing I did was um, I did I, I did this in my own head. I never named it to anyone really, but um, I called it the girlfriend project where I would just, uh, I took a month and I said, I'm gonna walk with as many different people as I can this month. And it, they're gonna be my priority. And every, you know, I'll stack them three in a row and I will go to them. Because, you know, it's always easy if someone comes to you, but I will make the effort to go to my girlfriend. So I, I keep thinking, gosh, I need to do it again. And now it feels like, where will it fit? But it did fit. And it's just about prioritizing. Well, you, listen, you've modeled it because you, it's, you know, you have four different jobs that you're managing and you got to keep your kids focused on the education, which is my goodness, you know, I can tell you at one point we had 11 of us in the household doing Zoom and I was amazed that the technology held up and because we were all competing for the bandwidth, you know, we're J&J, &J, we're in the business of healthcare and the world just is in the middle of a, you know, a global pandemic and a healthcare crisis. So it's like a big teaching moment to say, listen, I know you're really fatigued and you want to go play with your friends. You know, but we're losing people in plants and R&D and Juarez, it's a hot spot. And so, you know, for 
for me, the virus was oh always gosh, present. And, but you have to have empathy for the kids. You know, I used to, um, Peter Fasol would actually tell me this. He'd say, you know, you have to have empathy for the kids too. They're going through a hard time. <laughs> Cause I was just like, listen, the world is going through a real tough time right now. And, but I think that this generation, we're gonna learn a lot from them. I mean, they've been really enduring. And, you know, for many of us, this is the first time we've ever had to endure something this severe in the history of our lives. And um, we're all gonna learn about it. But I, I love your notion about walking with your girlfriends. We all have our little watches, getting our steps in. I think I've never put more steps in the past 16 months. It's a good, you know, de-stressor. And probably one of the biggest things we learn is, you know, pick up the fall and reconnect with that person that you just have, it's always been on your mind and you just have never taken the time to say, let me catch up with that someone from high school or someone from college or someone from the, you know, your church that that you kind of see that different look in their eye. Let me kind of prioritize that. So that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Deb. Okay. So my last question for you is coming into this new world, how would you like to see work get done in the future? You know, work of how you do movies, how you run your company, how, how Save the Children's Run, you know, we've learned different ways of working. And I'd love to maybe close with, you know, when you think of the future, what would be your wish list? Well, movies have to happen where movies are happening. You can't call your, you can't call in a performance. You have to go, you have to go to set and, and perform. Um, thank God, because it's a joy. Uh, so that, um, that's one thing. I mean, I hope that that I, personally, this is totally a personal view. I, I hope that vaccinations become mandatory to work on a movie set to keep the, the people who aren't wearing masks safe and just to keep each other safe because it's a bump up against each other, close contact. I mean, sometimes literally making out with someone kind of job, you, you want to just have the freedom to worry about what's in front of you and um, not be worried about, about safety. So that that's one thing. Um, once upon a farm, our little company, we're really able to say, look, we're going to have a smaller footprint in the world. And, um, you know, we had a small office anyway, but now it's tiny. Not everyone's allowed to go every day. And so let us know when you're going to be there. We're going to keep track. But I like that you can work from home. I think it's, you know, we're a company of a lot of young parents, and it just makes so much sense to have faith that you're your employees are doing what they need to do, but also give them the space to gather or to work from uh, work from an office if that is more productive for them. So it's just having faith in the people that you're working with. Now, Save the Children is um, is different. I need to see and I need to be with with people. I need to hear their stories. I need to see it with my own eyes because my job is then to go and tell their stories and share and advocate for them. And I need to do that at the nation's capital. I need to do that in, you know, um, in Lexington, Kentucky and in Charleston, West Virginia and in Sacramento. And um, so next week I'm, I'm up and running for SAVE. Next week I'm going to the border and seeing a detention center in our shelter right after the week after that, I'm going to West Virginia to visit homes and visit schools. And because that, that work needs to be on the ground. So I think everything is, um, is different, you know, what's necessary for that job. I think that's well said, you know, I, I, you know, I think that everybody overgeneralizes and you're really specific as like kind of the kind of work that gets the best outcome, how to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was very, very clear. Well, listen, I wanted to say thank you. We're up a time. It's been really fun. Look at her energy, guys, her energy, her enthusiasm, her optimism, her credibility and competency, giving back, paying it forward. Um, we do watch all your films, so we do get inspiration, and there's been a lot of good diversion from that when you're in a healthcare crisis, which all of us have been managing for, you know, 16 months now. So thank you for being a source of inspiration for us. Thank you. Thank you for, I mean, I got to be home and making restaurants with my kids because you guys were crunching nonstop and doing what you have done to keep people alive and keep and 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 make it all possible. So it's been um you know for people like me this has been hard like this. It's been just a joy honestly. And and I know why that is. I know it's because of your service and your sacrifice. So thank you um 
you know, grazie mille, or however you say it. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, good luck with your trips. I know you're going on the road. That's yeah. encouraging to hear you're starting to get out there and um, seeing is believing. So take care, Jen. Okay, take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.